So good morning and welcome to this live event from Open Street here in sunny Bradford. My name is David Howson. I'm the regional sales manager for the North and Scotland um, within Zen's um, channel. Um, and first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it should be a really informative and interesting hour session um, as we look at the end-to-end -end deployment of full fibre from both the exchange all the way through to the customer's premises. Um, at the end, we'll be having around about 20 minutes of Q&A. So again, thank you very much for all those people who have submitted questions. Um, and also, you can, you can submit questions um, on the live feed. So I'd like to introduce, um, first of all, Steve Warburton, who is our MD of our partner division. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, and yeah, big thanks to everyone joining us on the webinar today, um, and also to OpenReach for letting us host today's event here at OpenStreet. Um, I was lucky enough a couple of months ago to actually go out with uh, Dale Woodhouse, um, an engineer over in Leeds, and I saw firsthand the, you know, the challenges, the complexities involved in providing broadband services, um, some of the challenges with repeat faults, um, and also the benefits that full fibre is going to bring to the way that um, this, this technology is delivered. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, showing you around the facility today. So I'd like, like to introduce Nikki Reynolds, who is um, head of L&D. Sorry, <laughs> over this side, Nikki. Just before I start, I'm the head of the uh, Bradford Training Centre. Uh, I just don't want to wear, Matt Rainbow is the head of uh, L&D as a whole. I just know he's going to uh, pull me up on that. So uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Steve, for letting us host the event. Uh, it's a good opportunity to, for our service providers to actually see our training facilities. What we've got uh, here in Bradford is we've got uh, an open street, so an indoor facility, which is one of 12 in the UK. So in the UK, we've got facilities at Peterborough, we've got Southampton, Exeter, we've got the likes of uh, Thornaby at the north, Bolton, all around the uh, UK and Livingston. What we've got is got indoor facilities and outdoor facilities. What we're going to demonstrate today is what our facilities can do. Uh, and I'm going to pass you over to now to uh, Dominic Bottomler. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Dominic Bottomley. Uh, I am uh, in the Chief Engineers Innovation Team. Uh, recently moved in there, but I was also, before I was, uh, I was at Nikki's manager here in Bradford, uh, and I've done many of these tours in the past. Uh, so I'm now going to take you on a walk around. Uh, we're going to start in the telephone exchange. Okay, I'm going to initially show you uh, some of the copper frame and the size of the copper network, and then we're going to look at the ultra-fast network from the exchange all the way through to the customer. Okay, so... Hopefully we've swapped over cameras now. Okay, so we're going to come into the telephone exchange now. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you the copper MDF. That's the main distribution frame. It's just here behind me. Uh, the copper frame, this is where uh, I guess our ADSL comes out of. So that, that, that's our you know, standard broadband. Um, a frame of this size, if it was built to its full capacity, it would take somewhere in the region of about 12,000 customers. So you can see not quite a lot of space, but a, you know, a lot of capacity. Now I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the fiber optic equipment. So if we look at this, uh, this box itself, this is called an optical distribution frame. This effectively is our connection box between uh, our broadband uh, or our ultra-fast network and, you know, and uh, our access network that we've got outside. Um, we make our connection at something called an optical line termination unit. That's going to come into the ODF here. Um, it's going to connect into a clever little box at the top called a WDM, which I'll come back to in a moment. And then it's going to make a connection from there down out towards our network on our spine cables. Um, our spine cable effectively is like the, like the branch of a tree, so or, or like the big tree trunk. That's going to go out into the network on really large cables, which I'll show you more in a moment. And then from there, it's going to split off onto the smaller branches going towards all, all the customers. Um, I mentioned something called a WDM, okay, that, that, that's a wavelength division multiplexer. Effectively, all that's doing is combining two signals. So the reason we do that is for upgrading our network in the future. Because, um, you know, we're, we're not just thinking about the technology we, you know, you're going to want to consume now. We are planning already 5, 10, 15 years in advance and what the next generation of fiber optics is going to look like. Um, also, though, just at this moment in time, um, we've just gone past 5 million total homes passed uh, for OpenReach. So a fantastic achievement. Okay, we'll build 
faster than I think anyone else is at the moment. Um, to aid us doing that, we use, utilize something called an optical test head that makes our connection in through our WDM at this moment in time. Uh, and then what that does is it enables us to test our fiber optic circuits from the OLT, our optical termination, all the way through to our last build point, which is at the something called the Kekterize block terminal, which my colleague George will talk to you a little bit more uh, later on. Um, this box itself here, uh, if this was fully capacitated, uh, 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 full capacity for fiber to the prem, we'd be talking in the region of about 10,000 customers. So you can see from the size of a, a large frame over there with 12,000, we've got one box here about 1.2 meters wide, can already have 10,000. So, so it's a huge advance in the technology. So we're going to have a trip out now. So first of all, I'm just going to show you to the traditional green boxes you've probably all seen. I'll just briefly explain about those and then we'll look more at our fiber network. So what we've got over here, you can see we've got a multitude of uh, green cabinets or, or PCPs, primary connection points. Uh, we've got all our standard ones from our uh, DSM all the way down there up to our standard PCPs. But over here is a really interesting one. We've got this little box that goes on the side. Uh, this is called GFAST. Uh, this is part of our ultra-fast uh, deployment, and this goes over the copper network. Um, the GFAST enables uh, speeds up to 330 megabits, so absolutely fantastic product um, You know where, where we're deploying it out. Um, we're going to look at our fibre to the prem though as well. So after it's left the telephone exchange, it goes through uh, a cable, uh, a cable chain with joint, joins onto an external cable, and then it's going to go out into our network, down that big tree trunk to something called an aggregation node. So let's go have a look at that now. So as we get into our aggregation node, this is this is a, like a general point along something that we call our spine network. With our, with our uh, cables here, what we've got, we've got a very large cable coming in, uh, and that's thinking uh, uh, make a connection or a splice, as we call it in the fiber world, onto a much smaller cable. So I'm going to show you one of those cables at the moment. So this cable I've got here is a 432 fiber cable, and it's roughly the size of a Sharpie. So it's an absolutely fantastic product, and it's just one of those other little things that we, we you know, um, within the chief engineers, we've brought into the company and, and innovated. The reason this is such a great product is traditionally when we make our connections, we splice one fiber onto another fiber. So to do that, we've got to, we've got to like take the coating off the fiber, we've got to clean it, we've got to make a really perfect cut, something we call a cleave. Once we've done that, it's got to go into a splice machine, once all that's uh, fused together and spliced back together, we put a little protection over it, heat that up. Once that's done, it lays into a tray, all nicely protected, carrying that precious uh, data that, we, you know, that, that we're all sending all the time through the network on its journey. With the ribbon cable, though, what this does is it enables us to actually strip and cut uh, and uh, splice 12 fibers all at the same time. So once we've got it prepped and like laid in the tray, ready to go, actually it can really speed up our deployment. You know, as I said, we, you know, we've just gone past 5 million homes, so you know, it, it's obviously working for us. I'm gonna, hopefully you're going to be able to zoom in on this, but I'm going to try and open this fiber cable out. Just let me know if you can see that perfectly well. Yeah. So as you can see, the fibers are actually interlaced or latticed together, as I say. So rather than being one fiber, all 12 are connected which is why we've got to obviously use our fusion splicer to, uh, to connect all these together. The next thing the cable is going to do after it's left the aggregation node or it's joined onto a smaller cable is head towards something called a splitter. Um, I, I've always said a splitter is a bit of a wrong seal product. It does what it says on the tin. So let's go have a look at that now. So we've left our aggregation node. We're now going underground at the moment, uh, probably onto something like a 36 fiber cable, so much smaller. But you know, we only need one of those fibers to make the splitter work. So let's have a look at those. Uh, now we're at our splitter. This is what we class as a medium node. This will house two splitters, which in effect gives us capacity for 64 fiber to the prime customers. I'm going to lift this up very carefully and hopefully you can get a good shot of this. We've got two small little metal boxes in the bottom. Um, one, effectively, you can see a load of blue cables coming out of one and a load of orange cables coming out of the other. 
all that's for is for our, you know, our identification. So the blue is our primary splitter. That's the first one that goes in. That's one fibre in, 32 fibres coming out. That is uh, one pong, as we call it, or a passive optical network. The second one has got a one fiber, another fiber going in and 32 orange fibers coming out. That is our second pong out of this node or our second passive optical network. And it's really important that you understand about the passive optical networks or, or the pong. Uh, as I said, it's a really clever product, but it's very simple as well. No moving parts, light goes in and then that light gets split from one fiber into two. Each of those two fibers then get split into another two, which gives us four, and it keeps getting split through five stages. So we go from one to two to four to eight to 16, eventually to our 32. This gives us an amount of loss on our network, okay, but we factor that into our building uh, as we build our network. Um, obviously, through putting all these uh, fiber cables in, we're not the only people who put this in. We do a lot of it direct and we do a lot of it through our collaborative partners as well. So we're always working alongside our build partners and making sure everyone understands having the right light at these parts. Uh, we can do a lot of the testing of this via the optical testing as well, where, where we've deployed that. So re really, really clever little piece of kit. The, uh, from here, we're going to have a very short journey now towards our CBT or our connectorized block terminal. Uh, that will be within generally about 150 meters of the, the customer. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Joe, who's going to talk to you about the CBT. Not a very good start there. Uh, I'm Joe, a former engineer on FTTP, who's now a trainer here at Bradford. And I'm going to talk through the last piece of the FTP journey, which is the installation carried out by the engineer actually on the ground. So if you'd just like to follow me. So they, as it's already been pointed out by Dominic, it comes from the, uh, the splitter to the CBT. The CBT could be underground or above ground. This one in particular that feeds this property here is above ground. So if you just like to come round. You can see obviously the CBT on the pole at the top there and it comes via from the CBT via one of our overhead drop wires. Uh, there's several types uh, and we're in the process now of a new one which is the FOD which is the future overhead drop wire. Okay from there via down the drop wire it comes to the customer service point at this point, it's where it meets the internal cable, or well, the inside-out cable, where that comes out. It meets, it meets at this point here. We curl it up, uh, reel it all up into the CSP, and eventually then we finish off with the splice over in this point here. Joe, before we, um... before we move on, um, just have a, a, a question that came in um, from, from registration. And it was really around, Joe, what, what, sort of, what are the main faults you see from FTTP and how do they, how do they differ from traditional copper um, and fibres of the cabinet? Uh, one of the main faults we predominantly get would be a bad splice because uh, it's probably the only point of intervention where the engineer can be intervened because it's a splice. Uh, it probably relates to like a, a disc in the network on copper where the copper isn't joined together. It's very similar to that. Okay, fantastic. And um, is there anything that Zen and our partners could do to help um, the information we pass to partners ahead of FTTP installations, just yeah, to educate uh, them? That is probably one of the other issues is the lack of information the customer gets for when our visit, and they're not aware of what FTP is and carries out, where it's a full, a full install, as in replacing the old with the new. So yeah, that's pr probably a point which would be beneficial. So advising the customers better, I would say. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so this is Charlotte here, and she's going to show you on a KF4 splice. So we've got two types of splices we use. Predominantly for five to the prem, this is how a splice is done. So it's very important that the engineer gets this right. And it's making sure that the splice is correctly actually spliced because what we don't want to do is to do a poor splice and potentially within 31 days we actually go back out and have to revisit that customer so it's about getting it right first time this can be quite difficult so charlotte's going to try and make it as uh, 
as simple as we can, but the process is simple. The other thing is the environment. So if we were outside now, you've got all the weather conditions. Some of the stuff, the new innovations that we've done as open reach is we've got uh, sort of shelters for these. So we've got little uh, shelters what can go over the splice uh, and actually this splice are while it's being done. So the engineer is not getting wet, the splice is still intact, and then that's wrecked accordingly. But as you can see there, this is a really process which only takes a matter of seconds. And this splicer does it all for you. So it cuts it. it the only physical thing you have to do is clean it. The splicer does everything else. So it, it takes away the sheathing, it cuts the splicer, it splices it, and it actually cooks it. So that's where the protector's over it, and it makes that sort of protection a lot more a lot more secure. Uh, and it doesn't break as easy. Once it's, this is done, that is when it's then wrapped into the splice. As Joe's already mentioned, this is a process which our Fibre to the Prem engineers do every day. And it's a quick, slick process. What we're going to show you now is Joe is now going to finish this uh, sort of the, the end product. So we've gone from the exchange, we've gone now from the joints, we've gone into uh, the end customer, and this is where Joe's going to finish the journey. Okay, if you just follow me into the, the house itself. So the final pint of the journey, as I mentioned at the CSP, the inside out cable will be brought in and at this final point here, uh, we would actually test for the light source, clean it, plug it into the ONT and wait for the router to go blue. If you just, all I've put out on the front here is the how we've progressed. This was the ori original uh, setup we had for FVTP where we had the battery backup with the, uh, the ONT then we moved on to just the O&T, and as you can see, see now we've reduced inside side so, so to a smaller O&T uh, at the customer's end. So all I'm going to do now is just obviously connect it up, get it clean, put it in. Uh, as you can see, the pond lines come on, so we know we've got a solid pond, and then eventually the router will go blue. Once that had come up, we'd go to the customer, we'd test the network, making sure that everything was working and that the customer was, was happy with everything that's been carried out. And that would be the end of the journey for the engineer once he'd carried out all his testing. That's it for me. Thank you, Joe. I think we've had a couple of questions in. So one is, um, can we re-see the CBT? Can we see the CBT again? I think yeah. at the top of oh, the Oh, yeah. If I think the CBT, we may have missed it. Uh, probably the best side would be this side if you come round this way. And then you can get a full. You may have to come into this point here. Uh, the CBT at the top there. And as you can see, it's connectorized, so it's plug and play for the field engineer as he plugs it into the CBT. So there's no splicing or anything, it's just straight in. But before he has to do that, he does clean, he cleans it. Probably the most important thing as an engineer is to clean everything. That is okay. And the CBT can be placed overhead and underground. Okay. okay. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same lot. Lovely. And the other question that came in is, can we see the OLT in the exchange? So I don't think we have a, a live one in the exchange, but we have a. Unfortunately, you can't see a live one, I'm afraid. Uh, we don't have one here. They're rather expensive, and obviously, uh, as part of our uh, build to scale, we need to make sure these are out, uh, obviously, serving our customers. So the, we've got the next best thing, which is a, a picture. So, you know, hopefully you can see it. Um, I'll talk you through. So we've got our connections coming in. This is, I guess, bringing our, 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 our broadband, effectively, into the OLT. Uh, so some management in the middle. Uh, on this side, you can see the green cables going out. Uh, if you remember, our cabinets are green, so that's all all our fibre to the cabinet and on this side we've got our blue cables that is our fibre to the premise uh, but every one of these connections that goes out effectively is one of those passive optical networks so you know we, we've got a multitude coming out of here it's uh yeah it's a really clever piece of technology um and this is just our, our pawn at the moment and as i said before uh at the moment we're uh, we're already planning the, the next 15 years of what we're going to be deploying as well thank you cheers thanks dom 
So um, as, as the eagle-eyed amongst you probably have seen that we have um, obviously Charlotte who did the spi splicing um, is a female engineer. So I want to um, just catch up with um, Nicola Brumel, who is an account manager within Zen, who sits on our Women in Tech board within the, within the business. Hi, Nicola. Good morning. <laughs> morning, everyone. Um, I just want to ask Nikki, um, Live television. So I'll, I'll start that game. Uh, <laughs> so if you looked at the first two months of last year, when I say first two months from April to May, compared to uh, the first two months from April to May this year, there was an increase of, you're talking 10%, so it was just under 10% the uh, females coming through. But then you look at this year, and we're, I think we're hitting about 22 23%. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it shows that it's not, it doesn't matter if you're female, it doesn't matter if you're male. I think anyone can do the job. And I think all our training is based around an individual. Doesn't matter what sex you are, doesn't matter uh, neo -diverse, diversity. So it doesn't matter what sort of learning style you've got, we will cater to anyone. And we want to make sure that we, we've got a broad spectrum of sort of engineers what are within our business. That's great, Nikki. And, and obviously, Charlotte, what's it like being a, a female engineer? Uh, to be honest with you, it's no different than being a male. Um, we all do the same job day to day, um, whether that be climbing telegraph poles or going in the underground joint boxes. Great. Um, and obviously, to build on that, um, Zen, I've got some really great going on at the moment or they have over the last 12 months so we launched a step into tech program where we um, encouraged women to come on a training program within zen um, for a week and then interviewed them at the end of that week and out of the eight candidates that started six were offered jobs in um, technical support which, which is great to see um, we launched a mentoring program um, about two or three months ago where we've built six relationships based on leaders giving support and guidance to to fellow fellow females within the business um, and lastly we um, are going to build an external network of, of women um, and that's where we'll be asking our, our channel partners to get involved so sharing success stories career paths um, offering guidance challenges all that kind of stuff so um, they can watch out for that back to David I, I just wanted to uh, sort of focus on the because next week's International Women's Day. And I know two years ago, we had International Women's Day and we actually held the event here on Sunday. So if you ever went into any of the houses, all the sort of posts are from young females. And I think that is what, as a company, we are trying to push as well. But it's not just about females, it's about everyone. And sort of making sure open reach are welcome to all. So it doesn't matter your background, there is an opportunity in open reach for everyone. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that point. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Nicola, Nikki, and Charlotte. So we're now going to um, move into some Q and A. Um, so we've had um, a number of questions come through. Um, we've had some posted live during during the stream, um, and we've also had some posed as well um, through registration. So we'll just come over to. Um, we've got a, a panel of obviously Steve, um, Nikki, and Dom's just joining us. We're trying to all remain socially distanced. So um, it is live, I can assure you. So um, the first question we have, which I'll open out to probably Steve and Nikki, is I've heard FTTP is more around residential consumer and not business. What's your view on that, Steve and Nikki? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to kick off, Nikki, yeah. if that's all right. Yeah, I think um, it's a misconception, is my view. So I think... Um, you know, what we see is that, um, as I think Dom touched on earlier, you know, we're now at five million premises, which is fantastic and another great milestone to achieve. And what probably most partners aren't aware is that actually this 5.5% of those premises are actually business premises. So we're about 250,000 premises now, small businesses typically, that can now get full fibre services. As we look a bit further out, obviously the build rate's accelerating very quickly. Um, about 2 million premises a year is, is the plan. 
Um, and next year, we're aiming to get to 6% of premises. So, uh, you know, we'll be close to 400,000 businesses who can now get full fibre services. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's definitely um, change that conception that it's just um, residential, because it's definitely not. Thanks, Steve. Did you want to elaborate at all, Nicky? Yeah, I think we talk about fibre to the prem, but it's fibre to the prem is obviously the product. But regarding the skilling aspect of that is you've got cablers, you've got... Uh, civils, you've got five to the prem, you've got service delivery. Everyone plays their part in building that five to the prem. And I think it's important that we highlight that. But also, we've got the third party providers as well. And I know that's one of the questions, so I'm sort of going to answer that now, is what do we do with third party providers? So the likes of Tellen, Morrison's, KN, we're training them in-house now. So what we're doing with them is that we're training and then they're building our network for us. And I think we're trying to hit to that 25 million by 2025. That is doable, but it's making sure that all the cogs are turning and the third party provider is just one of those cogs. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. So um, second question in is um, probably more directed to um, you, Steve. Um, is what level of take-up are we seeing within Zen on ultra-fast FTTP services? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm delighted to say we've seen some fantastic take-up. I mean, as I'm sure we're very familiar, um, COVID created some very significant demand for internet and broadband and broadband services. Um, so as we entered COVID and as people started to stream more online, teaching the kids at home, um, you know, buying services online, um, what we saw is, is a doubling of demand for full fibre as people want faster speeds and they want a more reliable service. So if I look today, I think OpenReach are taking about 17,000 full fibre orders per week. Uh, we're seeing about 25% of our broadband orders are now full fibre, so very significant demand. Um, the other thing that we've seen change is the speed. So we're now seeing 30% of our full fibre orders coming through on over 100 meg. So that demand for more speed is, is certainly there. And I think that's, that's set to continue. You know, the trend we've seen over the last year, I don't see changing. And we'll continue to see this move to a full fibre. And it's really exciting. Really, really enjoying it. Thanks, Steve. Um, a, a reoccurring question, which we've already briefly covered off, is, is around the you know, fault, ty fault types in copper versus FTTP and FTTC. Um, I know we touched upon it briefly, but are you able to elaborate at all on Yeah, I don't mind taking this one. So you look at five to the prem, I think Joe's already touched. A prominent fault is, is the splice. So if the splice is not correctly done, then that's going to have a, it's going to have a fault volume. There's going to be more faults coming out. But it's also about there's potentially in our network for five to the prem, you've got the splitter, you've got the CBT where it's not cleaned. If that's not cleaned, then potentially there's going to be faults. Comparing five to the prem to copper, a lot of people would say it's like comparing chalk and cheese. It's five to the prem can be more reliable, but it's only reliable if the engineers are doing the correct, correct process. And you could say that's the same as copper as well, but within the copper network, and I know that some people will hear battery faults, earth faults, they can be anywhere in the network. Good thing for fiber is water doesn't affect it while copper water affects it. So with going to fiber, we've got uh, more speeds, but we've got lesser faults as well, which is a good, a go a good uh, selling point. Just to, just to build on that, David, if I, if I may. Um, so a couple of months ago, like I touched on at the beginning, I went out with um, Dale Woodhouse, an engineer over in Leeds. So I spent a day with Dale, and I got to see firsthand the challenges with diagnosing um, faults on the copper network. Um, you know, we went to a cabinet, I saw the, 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 the cabling, went to a home where there's a corroded copper cable and he had to repair that copper. So you, you can just see that this shift to full fibre is going to definitely result in a reduction in fault rate and improvement in reliability, you know, and make it easy for OpenReach's engineers to, to deliver and maintain the network. So I think it's a really significant shift and we shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of the move. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Nicky. Um, next question, which again is probably for you, Steve. Um, you're, in, you're in the hot seat here. Um, it's really what support is available from Zen to identify FTTP-enabled areas. Um, and that's coming from Martin Saunders. Yeah, so availability is obviously important. Um, as I say, we're at 5 million today, but it's accelerating very quickly. So last year, we, uh, we had created a tool within uh, our campaign centre, um, which some of our existing partners are, are utilising. And that basically allows you to go into the tool, uh, an online portal, and you can look for services by... Um, town, city, postcode, by exchange. You can filter by...
a residential or business premises. So we've got a really powerful tool. We're updating that on a regular basis as we get more open reach availability data. So um, I'll say that's the first thing. For those of you with an existing base with us, we can take that base of circuits and we can tell you whether or not any of those customers can get full fibre. And again, we're doing those checks very regularly um, to look at how we can support um, those partners. And I think thirdly, um, obviously, there's a, there's, there's a work to do to um, go out and promote these services to both existing customers and to new customers too. So within our tool, we basically provide some white label material that allows you to do uh, letter drops, flyers, um, put blog posts, we've got social media posts. We've got all sorts of tools that we can provide to help you go and promote this full fibre services to both new customers and existing. Okay. Thank you, Steve. So um, all those tools are available. So um, they are available through our portals. So get in contact with your account manager if you've not seen them already, and we can, we can certainly point you in the right direction um, to help us on our ultra-fast journey. Um, next question in was, um, again, directed probably to, to Joe and Nikki, um, is how, obviously it wouldn't be, obviously we need to mention the COVID word, you know, how, how have you coped um, from an engineer perspective, obviously, you know, with, with the with the pause on some new installs and obviously faults and entering properties, etc. I, I can answer that. Yeah, I'll probably go from the training side first and then go on to what it's been like for an engineer. From a training point of view, we reduce his numbers. But the good thing for the company, if you'd seen last week, our intake still kept on coming. So we had a, we've changed to a, uh, a virtual. So a lot of our training for the first two months was done virtually. What we found there is we can still take the intake of new recruits coming through, but we can train them virtually. Then they went to the training sites. We, I think I heard a stat yesterday that compared to last year or the year before, we're hitting probably 75% because that's what we're doing one to six. So we have got a backlog of where we've got engineers what potentially have still got to come through. But what we've seen now is that as open, we've, we've still kept on ploughing that money into the company, still bringing the new recruits in, still putting five to the prem at the forefront of everything we've done. Uh, from a Joe's perspective, Joe's going to now talk about what it's like for an engineer. I just wanted to highlight that the training, we've not stopped at all. So from May last year, every one of this training site has still been in, still been delivering training, still trying to make sure that we've got a footprint within five to the prem into the UK. Okay, yeah, from a, an engineer's uh, kind of perspective, uh, I can speak for myself here in West Yorkshire before I came across. Uh, obviously, the, the Open Reach put the guidelines in place. Uh, the PPE, the correct PPE was issued and them guidelines were put, was put in place for us. Uh, it also, at the, at, the height, uh, at the height of the COVID, when we weren't going into customers, we weren't visiting the customers, we've, we've been proactive in, we were doing the surveying the underground network, ready for the actual installs and say self, surveying the, the overhead, making sure everything was clear. So then once it did kick in and we could visit the customers again, it was all ready and we knew it was there and we can go down and send the engineers straight out on the jobs because we knew the network would be, be able to get straight in there. So that's what we're doing proactively in the background during the height of it. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then you touched upon it briefly um, around subcontractors, that this is a hot topic um, from a lot of our partners um, around, you know, how are you, how are you ensuring that they're working to the same levels as as, as OpenReach are? Yeah, I think if you looked at a fiber-based co-ord, for example, uh, when they go out, they've got an area, they've got subcontractors who are doing the work, but we have a process where we have a candid process where potentially we can look at their work if they've not done a good job, and but we paid for it, let's take some of that money back. Uh, and also we have a process where we do look at audits. So when a job's been done, let's go out there and audit it. Let's see if what we've paid for, that they've actually done. And that's a big thing what we've done, and I've seen that over the last couple of years. And it's real. you are going to get people what slip through the net, but that is where our processes come in. And we're really tight on that, that we make sure that we're checking everyone's work. And that's not just about a contractor, that's about our own engineers as well. So all our engineers get audited. So we make sure that all the work that we do is always odd. It's someone always looks. That's be it in training, that's be it out in the network. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Um, next question, back to you, Steve. Um, and this is really, as we're, as, we're, as we're moving from sort of copper and, and FTTC services to potentially one gig um, FTTP, how are Zen ensuring their network will support that traffic now and into the future? 
Yeah, great question, David. I think it's, um, I'd definitely say it's a challenge. So uh, and if I go back a year ago, we typically saw about a 30% increase in our network traffic year on year. As we entered COVID and as people started streaming Netflix more and doing their teaching the kids, et cetera, you know, we saw a massive increase in usage. So last year it was 73% the growth in our network usage, enormous growth. Now, fortunately, we've been providing full fiber services now for 10 years. So we'd already planned for a significant upgrade of our network to cope with these ultra fast speeds. Um, we had to bring some of those upgrades forward um, because of the uh, growth that we were seeing. And I think looking ahead, what I'd expect us to see is that we need to make more frequent updates to the network. Um, the plans we've got in place cater for the, the move, but I think we'll make the, the, the upgrades more frequently. And I've got to take the opportunity as well to thank our technology team who did an amazing job to keep our network upgraded, keep delivering the right capacity. You know, we went through a period over the last uh, 15 months where the nation have been very reliant on Zen and on OpenReach to deliver those services. You know, if, if your connection was down in the last 15 months, it would be a huge problem. And uh, I'm delighted to say our, our network remained up, reliable, you know, delivering those speeds that people needed through that period. So, um, yeah, really important, really important point. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, and then another question we sort of touched upon briefly, um, and I'll probably direct this to, to Dom, um, hiding, hiding in the corner. Um, and it was really, what, what can Zen and our partners do to help the order journey? And I know um, Joe mentioned about education, but is there anything else we can do from the quality of the information we're putting into the order? Um, is there anything normally you see missing or anything we can make, make your lives easier? Yeah, honestly, I think it is, it's just that information. I think it's just having that good, honest conversation with, with the customer about what it is that we're after. Uh, you know, I guess, is it the same, the correct products you, you're going to be giving them in the first place? Um, one thing we, we have noticed, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity for me to mention, is um, the <laughs> for, some, for some reason, uh, on our optical services, people seem to think uh, they should take the uh, little ONT box away. I think you've seen the ONT in the house, the little small box that plugs into the fiber cable. Um I think customers have got to understand that effectively that's the same as the telephone socket on the wall. Just, just leave, leave it be, leave it there, and then the, the next customer who comes in can, can use that one. You'll have a new one where you've moved to. Uh, yeah, we're, we're finding a lot of people think they should take it with them when they move house. So, yeah, that, that, that's not what we need. But okay, yeah. thank you. Um, one last question, then I'll, I'll just check to see whether we've had any more coming in. Um, and it's probably for, I think, Steve, you've got all this data probably in your head here. Um, and it's around the FTTP rollout over the, over the next five years. You know, what, what, what are we expecting to see, you know, ahead of the 2025 copper switch off? Obviously, you know, OpenReach are on a, on a path to deliver FTTP virtually everywhere. But what, what's that look like over the next five years? Yeah, great question, David. Great question. So... I think firstly, I was delighted in, and I think the um, April um, publishing of uh, BT PLC accounts to see Philip Janssen announced plans to expand the footprint from uh, 20 million to 25 million premises, so an additional 5 million prems. Um, so that's you know that's fantastic, and I think also. I think up to, up to nearly 4 million of those premises will be in rural areas as well. So one of the challenges that we've seen is um, people in rural areas sometimes not getting the kind of speeds that they, uh, they'd like to see, and that's going to change. Um, in terms of the rollout itself, um, currently we're tracking at 2 million a year. Um, again, I think in those announcements, they, they, they were originally going to, going to go to 3 million a year. That's now 4 million a year. So we're going to see a very rapid rollout of, of these ultra-fast services. You know, 5 million today. 25 million over the next five years, it's going to be a very, very big shift. And, and I would say, I do think this is a, a once in a generation opportunity. You know, the, 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 connect, the connectivity that's being put in the ground now will go beyond gig. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see 10 gig being provided. We're, pr we're providing um, GPON services today. I know OpenReach is planning to provide XGSPON, which will give us symmetrical speeds. So there's plans for this technology to, to evolve over time. Um, so I think, you know, for our partners listening, it's very important to get your customers onto this technology that's future-proof, that can scale um, and much more reliable, um, less faults, um, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Steve. Oh, sorry, yep. Just to elaborate a little bit on what Steve said there. Um, yeah, so the... You've just mentioned about XGS upon there, yeah. So that, obviously, I said before that's something we're looking at over the next like five years, or like you know, and, and beyond that as well for like the, the next generation after that as well. Uh, but you, you you hit the nail on the head really there when you talked about the fiber optic. 
the fiber optic cable we're putting, if we build it well and we build it right, then that fiber optic cable will effectively take any speed. Okay, I, there's obviously there's always advancements in fiber optics technology coming out, and that's only going to allow us to do more without fiber technology. But yeah, the, the main thing is that we build it well, uh, and we, we build it at that scale that that, that suits you, you know, your needs as well. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Dom. Um, and the final question before we we, we wrap up is um, obviously on the back of the 2025 copper switch off, um, and the question was: Are we going to see a degradation in in phone line? and voice services, um, given the fact that copper is switching off. Um, obviously, we're deploying FTTP, and there's going to be VoIP over, or cloud comms, as, as we call it, within, within Zen. But I don't know, Steve, Dom, or Nikki, if you want, wanted to comment. Talk a little bit about the, the VoIP, um, have it, having you know, we, within our reach. Obviously, we, we trial a lot of our products internally as well. Uh, I was very privileged to be a part of the uh, Voice over IP trial. Uh, my phone line at home is a synthetic dial tone. I haven't had a dial tone for about two years now or so. Uh, it works really well. Wi-Fi broadcasts all the way around the house. Uh, the phone system is fantastic. Um, so from that product, that I, I'm, I'm not, not sure I'll sell it. I'm just going to say from my own personal experience, it's been really good. Um, so I don't see why there should be any need for any degradation in service you know, while while we get towards that switch over, personally. Prems now available on FTTP. But let's not forget, we've still got 23 million Prems that are on copper-based services, ADSL, FTTC, GFAST as well. So um, you know, from Zen's point of view, we're fully committed to continue to deliver those services. Clearly, not everybody can get FTTP today, so we need to continue to deliver those. Um, I think OpenReach Arc continues to be committed to the copper network um, and will be um, right through to, to the to the dates that have been referenced. One thing I would say, though, is there's been some talk, and I'll, I'll talk about it now, around stop sell and are we going to hit stop sell? Um, is it just a, a date that actually will just move way beyond that and, and we won't actually um, pull the plug on, on copper? And one thing I stress is um, it is important. We see that as a, as a real date we need to achieve. You know, OpenReach have a firm plan to meet those dates. So uh, let's make sure we all play our role in uh, helping them get there. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. So I think that concludes um, our live Open Street event. So before I hand over to Steve, just to to close, I just personally want to thank, obviously, everyone here at um, Open Street, um, everyone within Zen who's made this event possible. Um, obviously, marketing, um, all the account managers, and obviously all our partners. So for a closing piece, I'll hand back over to Steve. Yeah, thanks, David. And I think I'd absolutely reiterate that. You know, massive thanks to Nikki, to Joe, to uh, to Dom, to Charlotte, to everyone from OpenReach that's allowed us to put on this event today, and also the Zen team. I know it's been uh, been our first live event, and uh, I think it's gone great. So uh, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. Um, and then a second thank you I'd like to to make is on behalf of all of our partners. So I know we've got you know 300 or so of our partners on on the the webinar today, and um, I'm sure they'd all um, support me in saying that in this last 15 months. OpenReach have been continuing to go out and install FTTP and copper services, repairing those services too. And, uh, and I saw myself a few months ago, it's hard work. And um, they've done that through a very, very difficult period of time with COVID. And I want to say a massive thank you to everybody from OpenReach, all the engineers, all the teams that support those guys um, for keeping that network running. Um, quite frankly, the country would have come to a standstill if it wasn't for those teams. So I just want to take the opportunity to, to say thank you. And thank you for everyone who's listened in and um, taking your time out of your busy diaries to uh, hear today's event. I hope you've enjoyed it and um, look forward to uh, seeing you all soon. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone.